Coming up next, a number one hit that took 10 years to write the chorus for. The singer had the verses finished, but he'd been searching for this chorus for so long, he just felt blocked. And he had pressure to write a hit for his band's next album because uh, previous album had not done well. So he scheduled a writing session with a famous contemporary. But the morning of, he canceled because he was just physically sick. He was so frustrated, he started cussing. He was screaming out to his muse, what is this song about? Just then, it hit him like a ton of bricks. Up next, a story of one of the 80s greatest number one hits from the singer himself. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you find yourself flipping through the channel on cable and then pausing on the Time Life music commercials for those box sets a little too long, singing along without even realizing it, you're going to enjoy this channel. I do that all the time. Before I know it, five minutes has gone by, 10 minutes. For just $9.99 on compact disc or double length cassette, that's more than one. As the stories from the legends, make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of this music celebration. Click the bell, all that good stuff. Also, if you want more videos, other great benefits, click on our Patreon link that helps us do more interviews. And also check out our latest merch. We've got that below. Uh, we actually have our Vintage Years collection. 1985, the midpoint of the greatest decade in history, at least in my opinion. It was the year of Live Aid. Mama. It was the year that the charity single We Are the World by USA for Africa was released, uh, bringing considerable focus to the plight of Ethiopians. We are the children. It was a year that Brits like Phil Collins and Wham and Tears for Fears and Dire Straits and AHA battled Americans like Madonna, Holland Oates, Huey Lewis and the News and Whitney Houston for chart supremacy. Also, the PMRC, Parents Music Resource Center, freaked out about the Filthy 15 uh, and other groups and songs that were corrupting our young minds. I certainly didn't feel corrupted back then. For some reason, it only made me want to go out and buy more Wasp and Motley Crue albums. <laughs> well, 85 was a good year for another American band who would fight for the number one spot in the charts uh, for a welcome and needed AOR comeback. And it came in the form of Ario Speedwagon's power ballad, I Can't Fight This Feeling. Ario had taken the world by storm in 1981 with the biggest selling album of the year, the 15 week spectacular High Infidelity with equally great singles, Keep On Loving You. Gotta keep on loving you. That went to number one and Take It On The Run, which went to number five. Run, and it seemed like this band would be at the top of the charts forever, but their next album really suffered from being put out too fast. Uh, Singer-songwriter Kevin Cronin said that after the huge success of I Am Fidelity, everyone's putting pressure on uh, he and the band to get back into the studio as quickly as they could to ensure that they you know, made the most of the situation. As the main songwriter, Kevin uh, felt that he didn't have enough good material or enough good tracks that really met his standard. But the pressure was immense and he buckled under it. Uh, he pushed to get what he had recorded and the result was the 1982 album, Good Trouble. Now, as soon as the record came out, it was clear that they were in good trouble. Sorry, had to go there. It wasn't going to have the, the kind of massive success that High Infidelity had achieved. The album went to number seven. I mean, it was respectable. The first single, Keep the Fire Burning. The fire burning all night that went into the top 10, but it fell out of the charts quicker than those previous hits had. Although it did feature Kevin on keyboards, where he was regularly the extra guitarist. Uh, uh, through the years, a Good Trouble album has been mostly passed over by Ario when they played their stuff live. Only Keep the Fire and the underrated single The Key have been uh, performed in any fashion over the last 40 years. After that, the band really had their work cut out for them. As soon as they finished the sessions for their next album, 1984's Wheels Returning, they weren't sure that they had that breakout hit song that would take the album to the masses. As they were getting ready to finish uh, the album, 
Kevin Cronin felt that he needed to finish a song that he'd written many years before. I mean, he had all the verses, those fell out really quickly, but he had no chorus. He was completely blocked and had been for years. It was so bad that he had plans to try to get with a famous contemporary to write it. I'll let him tell you that amazing story of how it all came together and about the line that he's gotten so much crap for over the years that has gone down in 80s history, let's be honest. You'll know what I'm talking about. When REO dropped Wheels Returning in 84, it got off to a really slow start. The first single, I Do Wanna Know, that stalled at number 29, and the band was wondering if they were doomed again. So they dug out I Can't Fight This Feeling, praying for a comeback. Find out what happened next, and also what, what it was like for, for Kevin and the boys to play Live Aid in front of tens of millions. So we get into this interview uh, with Kevin. I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. They've sold 50 million glasses. They have awesome, an awesome selection of frames for any occasion. Go design your own pair of custom glasses, just like mine, blue light protection or anything else, at the Zenny link below. Here's Kevin with the story. I can't fight this feeling any longer. Well, wheels are turning. Let's talk about that. Can't fight this feeling again to have a, such a huge song that remains in the culture today. Tell me about Can't Fight This Feeling. After the Good Trouble experience, I knew yeah. I needed to kind of reboot. And I, need, I felt like I just needed to get away, go someplace where I could just kind of be by myself, no one recognized me, so I went to Molokai, and I stayed there for a couple of months. And so that kind of cleared my head a little bit. I wrote uh, Live Every Moment. Live moment. When I got home, we had most of the record finished, and we just, you know, like most records, it's like you kind of go, God, we just need, we're missing one song. There's yeah. all, every record that you make, you're always missing one song, you know? <laughs> and I had written the verses for Can't Fight This Feeling years before. And they had always stuck in my mind. I felt they were, it was really heartfelt to me. It was it was kind of the root of, you know, who I am as a person and, and what I was struggling with. And I just, I felt like, man, if I could finish that song, I think that's the song that, that needs to be on this record. Yeah. But I was blocked. I couldn't figure it out. One day, I, you know, we've, I, I thought, well, maybe I need to write this with someone. And I, uh, long story short, I, I canceled the, the writing session with Eric Carmen. Eric was going to come over because I yeah. was like, I woke up that morning and I was literally physically sick because I knew I had a right. I, if, you know, it was like a, it was like a bailout to bring to bring in someone else. I knew something inside of me was saying, you got to do this. You man. can do you it. Got to yeah. freaking do this. You know and. <laughs> And I, so I woke up and I was like, all right, why can't I finish this freaking song? What? So I went back to my lyric book and I realized the opening line of the song was, I can't fight this feeling any longer. I didn't have the chorus yet. And I was like, oh, that's, that's the essence of this song. That's the title of this song. I, didn't, I hadn't realized it. And I was like, that's a horrible freaking song title. This is, this is probably going to ruin this song forever, but it's like, all right, if that's what it is, that's yeah, what it is, because yeah. that's the title of the song. And when I came to that realization, I, I went downstairs to the piano and I wrote, um, even as I wander, I'm keeping you in sight. Yeah. You're a candle in the window on a cold, dark winter's night. And, I'm getting and then the next line, which of course I've caught so much crap for, it's time to bring this ship into the shore sure, yeah. and throw away the oar. I mean, I get so much crap for that line. And I and deservedly. I mean, it's just, you know, but it's like that came to me. The as pacing, a, it, though, and the rhyming of that just worked. It worked. Did, it was like you know? I knew I was going to get shit for it because it was, <laughs> it's just, it's almost bubble gum. And I was like, I knew that, that there would be a lot of people that would hate it, but I also had this feeling that it would stick in people's yeah. Oh, yeah. In heads so much that I couldn't possibly not use it in the song. That part of the song came to me in like basically one take. I'd been working for, I'd been thinking about it for 10 years and it took that one moment. So when you were composing it, did you do it on the piano or the guitar or how did that? You it know, was the on the piano, part yeah, the, 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 um, the original, uh, yeah, the original Can't Fight This Feeling is on the piano, 
but I'm not a real piano player. I never took a piano lesson. I just kind of, you know, tinker around on it when I'm yeah. writing sometimes. So I'm a little limited in what key I can play in. I played Keep On Loving You and Roll The Changes. I did play the piano yeah. on those records. Yeah. But when it came to Can't Fight This Feeling, the key that I wrote it in and mm -hmm. the only key that I was capable of playing it in wasn't the right key to <laughs> sing it in. So when I brought it in, I said, I, I got it, brought it to Neil. I'm like, Neil, you got to help me with yeah. this. Like, can you play this? He was like, yeah. So he took it up, took it up a step and did a beautiful job playing that. Was so much better than my, my piano part was just, <laughs> you know, really basic. Neil took the piano to another level, which was really cool. It's been used in culture so much. I was watching with my kids, and they, of course, recognized the song from the concert when we were watching Goldberg's. Have you, have you oh, seen yeah, how they use yeah. it on that? Yeah. What started out as friendships getting stronger. Come on. It was using Stranger Things, season three. Also, Rock of Ages. Yeah. <laughs> Alec Baldwin and Russell Brand. I can't fight this feeling any longer. It just so happened that I was in the area when they were filming this particular scene and they, uh -huh. they had called me to see if I wanted to just do a cameo in the movie. And, and my family and I were on our way back from, uh, from the Bahamas and they were filming in Miami. So my daughter and I went down and did this scene and we literally spent from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. on the set with Russell Brand. <laughs> what a trip, man. I mean, that guy is one of the funniest, oh, most yeah. just out there, just like lovable human beings that I've ever, <laughs> you know, it was a, such a such a treat to be able yeah. to hang with him. You give my life direction, you make everything so. Corey Monteith, who is, is passed on. I know. But so uh, yeah, so sad. But that was kind of that defining moment, that first episode of Glee, besides the don't stop believing part of the end, but when he's singing, and he hears him singing that song, and then they try to get him in. I mean, that's just a great moment. And I can't fight this feeling anymore. Glee was one of those TV shows that are few and far between. Right. Or especially with our family, because my daughter's way into musical theater. My mm -hmm. wife loves musical theater. My boys, they're basketball guys, but they yeah. like music too. That was one of the few TV shows that you could sit down on the sofa with the whole family and watch. And... You know, having, and it introduced all this great music to the younger kids, exactly. you know, the songs. It really did. And for a moment, I was actually cool again, you know, with, <laughs> yeah. with my kids. It's like, wait, yeah. Dad, that's your song. You must, you know. Yeah. You know, as far as my kids are concerned, I'm just some guy that, you know, <laughs> played in a band a long time ago. Right. Well, Live Aid, that must have been quite an experience. I mean, such a huge, I always remember, I watched it on MTV, you went after Rick Springfield <laughs> Tell me about the moment of, of going out on that stage and playing Live Aid and just being part of that. Uh, Live Aid was, was amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, REO Speedway. Not only did we play at Live Aid, but CNN decided that they were going to have their film crew mm -hmm. follow me from the time we arrived in Philadelphia to the time we left. So we got in the night before and I've got this following me everywhere I go. And <laughs> I was a little freaked out to begin with. Yeah. Live Aid, it was huge. Oh and, yeah. You know, and for for someone who is basically you know ridden with insecurity, in my mind, I'm all I could think of was, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? Yeah. Crosby, Stills, and Nash are here. Oh yeah. You know, uh, my all my heroes are here. Yeah. I, I should be home watching this. You know, <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't be here on stage. So I was a. Uh, I was a mess, and I really had a rough night the night before, honestly. But we got there in the morning, and the backstage area at Live Aid was just like, talk about being a kid in a candy store. It's like, there's Black Sabbath. I think, it, was it Rick Springfield or was it, I know Black Sabbath, maybe Black Sabbath came on right after us, yeah. but they were, we were really close to them. And, wow. And, you know, it was just like all this amazing rock and roll history and energy mm -hmm. and artistry and people I looked up to and wow. and there I was in the middle of it and I was like holy crap you know this was <laughs> just it was so overwhelming not to mention the 80,000 people in oh, you yeah. know in the stadium and you knew that it was being beamed all over the world no sound check 
no nothing. We yeah. walked out there. I think Gary had to tune up his guitar, you know, right yeah. when we were there. But it was great. Once we walked out on stage and started playing, I, I was just like... It dissipated. I, I was the happiest guy on the planet. <laughs> well, I can't fight this feeling any longer. Most human beings, I think, experience... They say that the biggest fear people have is speaking in front of a, of a crowd. Mm -hmm. And so most people experience stage fright. Mm -hmm. I personally experience not being on stage fright. Kind of the only time <laughs> right. I'm not freaked out is, is when I'm on stage. That's, <laughs> that's when I feel, that's when, I, yeah, that's when I'm in my element, you know? And my life's kind of journey has been to, to you know, find that, that peace within myself outside of, of, of the, the performance. And uh, so, you know, that's why I'm really fortunate that, uh, that I've got a wife who, who keeps me in line and, <laughs> and, uh, and three children who just love me as a daddy. And yeah. they, they could care less about anything else. And <laughs> it's really been a journey to kind of ground myself. So um, I'm getting there. I'm seeing that I'm still, still uh, the journey never ends. I'm getting closer. What was it for you that kicked open the door to your mind, made you want to pursue music, that kind of kicked that off? The opening chords of I Want to Hold Your Hand. <laughs> da, 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 da. I mean, to this day, the first thing that happens when the house lights go down at an REO Speedwagon concert is you hear those chords. Mm -hmm. And it's partially because you know, it's a cool thing for the audience, but it's really because it just connects me with that moment right before I walk out there. And I've heard that intro to I Want to Hold Your Hand a million times, and every time I hear it, it just, my juices get flowing and I'm ready to rock. Oh yeah, tell you something. You saw it on Ed Sullivan, right? I did. It's amazing because about 80% of the musicians, when I ask them that question, they're like the Beatles and Ed Sullivan. It's like, if, if that moment wouldn't have happened, would rock and roll be what it would have happened? I don't know, man. I, I, I can't imagine the world without th those moments, you know? It just connected so many people. I mean, of course, I wasn't there. I wasn't even born yet, but I can just imagine Ann Wilson of Heart was telling me that she just wanted to get closer to the TV to just be a part of that energy, you know? Yeah. Like so many musicians of my generation, it was seeing the Beatles play on Ed Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! That was really the moment when the light bulb went on. But I think it was different in the case of myself and my sister because we wanted to do it. We didn't just want to be there, be the girlfriends of the Beatles. We wanted to go out and be the Beatles. Right. And be the experience. It's interesting because I've interviewed like 80 musicians and I swear like 80% of them say the Beatles. That was a powerful moment, you know, yeah. I, on television and for rock and roll in general. I mean, it, I think it was the first time rock had been shown just that way on TV. And it just opened up every, the, the tops of everyone's heads it, to the possibility of what could be. I read somewhere, I saw something where you said that you just wanted to get closer to the TV just to, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. feel that energy and become that. It was like a, a, a campfire and the whole world was sitting around it. At the, at, you know, we, we were all connected at that moment. I mean, everybody that I know from my generation of, of musicians, like you say, you know, it's like, it's a connection that we all have. We were all sitting there <laughs> watching it in black and white going, holy cow, man, that's, cause you know, up until then there were singers, you know, there were like the Four Seasons, the groups that kind of wore matching clothes and did their choreography and that was a thing. And there were the Brill Building songwriters mm -hmm. who provided the material and then there were the backing bands who, who you know, played the, the instruments. And up until then, I, I, I was taking guitar lessons, but I, I wasn't really kind of sure why. And when the Beatles came out, it was like the Maxell tape commercial. Maxell, it's worth it. My mind was blown yeah. because it was like, 
wait, these guys are playing the songs, they wrote the songs, mm-hmm. they're singing the songs, they're, these four guys are doing it all. And I was like, it just was so clear to me at that moment that that's what I wanted to do. I wanna hold you. Now, you know, I'm very fortunate that that the, the, that the path cleared yeah. in front of me, oh, and that, yeah. the, that the stars were lined up. But at that moment, there was no doubt in my mind that I would be sitting here right now talking to you about wow. having a, a you know a career a, a career as a as That's a musician. Continues. When I look back now, yeah. I go, the chances are so. I mean, they're infinitely small that that, that this oh, yeah. would happen. So I'm just so. Uh, you know, I'm just so thankful that I'm still doing today what I was, what what I dreamed of doing when I was 12 years old watching Ed Sullivan. Hey, thanks so much for watching. When we recently had uh, Kevin Cronin out for a Professor of Rock live event, it was awesome. My 14 year old, he was freaking out. He loves our music. And Kevin was so gracious. He gave him a signed set list from the concert. Here's some pictures. I just wanted to share them with you. Just a great guy. Leave us a comment about Kevin Cronin and this classic 80s power ballad. What are your memories? What did you think of the three albums from High Fidelity to Wheels? To get more of this interview and many others, click on our Patreon link below. Actually, we put up a full interview of ARIO this week, so check that out. Uh, if this content resonates with you, make sure to join our community below by subscribing. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm-hmm.